Good morning Year 12. Today we're going to look at the nature and range of the sources. There are three broad categories of primary sources that throw light on the fate of the cities of Vesuvius as well as on their architecture, social structure, politics, commerce, religion and aspects of daily life. However, while there is an abundance of archaeological and epigraphic material, the literary sources, apart from Pliny the Younger, are relatively few and fragmented. As Andrew Wallace Hadrill says, it is premature to say that we understand Pompeii. It is at once the most studied and least understood of the sites. Mary Bead says, the Pompeii paradox paradox is that we simultaneously know a huge amount and very little about ancient life there. It is true that the city offers us more vivid glimpses of real people and their real lives than almost anywhere else in the Roman world, but the bigger picture and many of the more basic questions about the town remain very murky indeed. The Archaeological Record when we see the amount of material remains already unearthed from below the four meter meters of pumice, ash and other volcanic debris at Pompeii and from under the 20 meters of solidified volcanic material at Herculaneum, we should remember that only two thirds of the 66 hectares of ancient Pompeii have be, has been excavated. The excavation carried out at Pompeii has proven to be, over the years, a nightmare of omissions and disasters. Only about four blocks of Herculaneum have been completely unearthed, the rest being under the modern town of Racina slash Herculano. Herculino, sorry. Now, there is a number of different public structures. These include roads, town walls and gates, water towers and fountains, temples, law courts and markets of the forum, public baths, lavatories, theatres, amphitheatre, exercise ground and port facilities. The private structures include townhouses from palatial to humble, apartments, suburban and country villas, shops, taverns and inns, workshops, brothels and tombs. Problems associated with studying and interpreting the architecture of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Much of the architecture of Pompeii that has been unearthed has disappeared forever, and many of the 800 houses, 600 shops, and workshops excavated have not been the study of serious. Um, sorry, have not been the study of subject of serious study. Without some knowledge of the artifacts, decorations and epigraphy associated with the buildings, most of which were removed or stolen without any record of their context, it is hard to deduce such things as ownership, functions of rooms, standards of living and the status of the people who use the buildings. There is often no lit available literary evidence to check against if it does ex or if it does exist, it does not tally with the archaeological record. There are, there are few public buildings and spaces in Herculaneum and no forum as in Pompeii. This limits the opportunities for an understanding of the town's political and commercial life. Some of the questions asked of the architectural remains of the, in the past were based on subjective impression and uncontrolled conjecture. Many of the early archaeologists did not know how to read the architecture of private st structures for example, they failed to appreciate that the Romans did not seek work, see work and home as separate, had a different concept of room usage, did not segregate women within the house and create special places for children. They lived in close proximity with their dependents, slaves and freedmen, clients and tenants who were the source of their economic power, and they did not distinguish between residential and commercial units. Inscriptions on, and wall paintings Pompeii may be likened to one vast archive. Apart from the formal inscriptions on stone, marble and bronze that reveal important events, most of the epigraphy is of a spontaneous character, painted and scratched on the outer walls of both private and public structures. These examples that have survived reveal very intimate and human moments. 
formal inscriptions. These inscriptions include civic charters and regulations on bronze plates fixed to walls of public buildings. Dedications by wealthy citizens who saw it as their social duty to provide buildings and festivals and to support the imperial cult. Their commemorative plaques can be found at prominent positions within the city, on public buildings, temples and pedestals for statues around the Forum. One such commemorative plaque in the Forum honours Quintius Valgus and Marcus Porcius, who paid for the building of the amphitheatre. Funerary inscriptions found on the tombs lining both sides of the road outside the Herculum gate, Herculaneum Gate in Pompeii. From these inscriptions, historians can learn who the prominent families were in various periods, the structure of government, the main political players, when buildings were constructed or renovated, and the economic, political and social transformations that occurred in society, especially in the first century AD. Wall writings. Most of the wall writings, such as public notices and graffiti, refer to act activities and events in the years immediately preceding the eruption of 79 AD. Public notices. Public notices were written with a brush in red or black on freshly whitewashed walls. Most of these notices were painted by professional scribes on the outer walls of houses or other buildings at the, personal's, at the person's disposal. The walls were whitewashed with lime by a whitewasher and then at night the scribe wrote his message by the light of an oil lamp. However, sometimes an individual did not employ professionals but did the job himself. Public notices were of three types, electoral posters or programmata, of which 2,500 have been identified that urged citizens to vote for a particular political candidate. They covered the outer walls of build houses and other buildings and many of them were found on the main roads where they were likely, sorry, where they were more likely to be seen. The candidate himself did not say, sign these slogans. They were usually signed by family, friends, clients or guilds. For example, Vesonius Primus urges the election of Gnaeus Helvius as ideal, a man worthy of public office. Of the 30% that was assigned, 52 by, were by women, even though they could not vote. Programs that announced the shows coming to the amphitheatre, Edict Edicta numerum, num, numerum. These were as important as electoral posters. Local magistrates, editors, menurum, were responsible for paying all or part of the expenses of the gladiatorial shows or spectacles. These programs included the magistrates' name, political and religious positions, the occasion and type of spectacle. Notices for property sales and rentals. Advertisements for sales and rentals were also painted on the city walls. For example, Julia Felix, one of Pompey's chief property owners in the years before the eruption, advertised part of a property for rent. <coughs> Graffiti in the form of inscriptions or drawings were scratched into the surface of any available wall with stylus, iron nail, wooden splinter or toothpick. Any Pompeian could share his or her own deepest feelings and jokes, spread gossip, express contempt, threaten an enemy, give a political opinion and advertise services and fees. Writing on walls was so widespread that the following comment in various forms circulated in Pompeii. I wonder, Wall, that you do not go smash. Who have to bear the weight of all of this trash? It may have seen trash or nonsense at the time, but today the ancient graffiti is an invaluable source of information about the inhabitants of Roman towns. Since Pompeii was a town dedicated to Venus, graffiti concerning love, devotion, jealousy, bitterness and sexual frustration were scattered throughout the city. Faithful Caecilius loves M and Serena hates Isidore. 
Much of the graffiti was related to gladiators who were adored by Pompeian women and gladiatorial spectacles, rather like the sports page of a modern newspaper with a bit of sex thrown in. Most of these graffiti were concentrated near the amphitheatre, where the victories and losses would have been fresh in the minds of spectators. The most explicit graffiti was, were found in brothels, baths and public lavatories. May I always and everywhere be as potent as I was here. In a lavatory of the house of the gem in Herculaneum was a graffito Apol Apollinaris, the physician of the Emperor Titus, had a good shit here. Business took advantage of the wall space to promote their services and customers did not sh express, hesitate to express their opinions or calculate their expenses. Crude scratchings were found on the walls of taverns along with comments about drinking and gambling and others by disgruntled ta tavern owners. I won 855 sesterces at dice, no cheating. So Salvus demands full wine jars, please, and his thirst is enormous. And Scram, do your quarrelling outside. Random declarations offering political opinions were found everywhere, but some of the angrier examples were found, as might be expected, around a basilica in Pompeii where justice was administered, um, trials were held, and business transactions carried out. Samius to Cornelius, go hang yourself. Mary Beard writes, We meet unlucky lovers, successors, the weavers in love with a barmaid called Isis, and she doesn't give a toss as one scrawled graffiti runs. And shameless bedwetters, I pissed myself in bed. I messed up, I haven't lied. But dear landlord, there was no chamber pot supplied, boasts the rhyme on a lodging house bed, uh, bedroom wall. Wax tablets and rolls of papyri. Two bundles of wooden tablets coated with wax have been excavated from Pompeii and reveal the business activities of the banker Caecilius Jucundus and two merchants, Sulpicius uh, Senamus and Sulpicius Faustus. Three were more dossiers referred to as a Herculaneum tablet throw light on the legal status of a freed slave, relationship between neighbours, family structure and quarrels over slaves and between landowners. In the remains of the villa, villa of the Papyri outside, just outside Herculaneum, archaeologists found a cache of 1,800 fragile scrolls of carbonised papyri. However, difficulties involved in opening these scrolls to read their contents were formidable and numerous attempts over the years failed due to their extreme fragility and the fact they were burnt by the sea 300 degrees Celsius volcanic flow, compressed by the weight of rubble and mud and congealed by water. Eventually, several hundred were cut, partly cut apart. They turned out to be the works of Ep Epicurean philosophy by the first century BC Epicurean philosopher Philodemus, Philodemus of Gadara, who came to Italy around 80 BC. Apparently, the villa of the papyri contained an extensive library. The difficulties were not overcome until recently due to the efforts of the International Centre for the Study of the Herculaneum Papyri. Decorative Arts Wall Paintings the decoration of walls with frescoes was found at all levels of society, from the elaborate mythical paintings in the great reception rooms of the wealthy, to the simple thin lines of colour or geometric patterns on the homes of those lower down the social scale. Even the walls of garden porticos became veritable outdoor art galleries in wealthy homes, often featuring representations of decorative house furnishings such as bronze and marble sculptures, pedestals displaying herms, <coughs> masks and statues of Bacchus, Venus and various woodland deities. The Villa of Mysteries, such as just outside Pompeii, featured a style of painting referred to as megalography. Since the discovery of these larger-than-life figures, in the early years of the 20th century, the paintings have provoked debate as to their meaning. 
Only those areas isolated from public view, such as kitchens and the slave quarters, were usually devoid of paintings. In the last 20 years, the study of painting has re expanded to, to reveal a much more complex and interesting purpose behind the use of decoration in Pompeian homes. Mosaics. Mosaics are pictures and designs done in thousands of tesserae or tiny chips of coloured glass, stone or pottery. Floors of buildings in Pompeii and Herculaneum featured a variety of geometric designs and figurative elements, generally in black and white. The most famous coloured mosaic floor in the House of the Fawn featured a copy of a Hellenistic composition, Alexander the Great, fighting Darius at the Battle of Isis. Or Isis. The floor mosaics of this house had more in common with Hellenistic palaces than most other than most other upper class houses. Mosaics were often found on walls, columns, nymphium, and even the vaulted roofs of bathrooms of baths. Decorative household odd items as a sign of social status. Silver was rare in the Roman world and re refined Romans, according to Pliny, collected the finest embossed silverware. Antique pieces were particularly sought after. Wealthy families loved to flaunt these silver dining settings as well as silver and fine ceramic ware and glass vases at their feasts and banquets as a way of advertising their wealth and as a sign of their social status. There is also documentary and archaeological evidence that silver plate could be used as security against loans. In 1895, during an excavation on the villa of Pis Pisanilla at Boscorio, thought to have been owned by the Pompeian banker El Caecilius Eucundus, a hoard of 190 pieces, nine pieces of silver were found in a chest hidden in a wall in the room containing the olive and wine presses. 35 years later, when Amadio Mauri was excavating the house of Menander in Pompeii, he located a treasure that comprised 118 pieces of silverware, several of which were quite ancient and evidently restored, as well as earrings, gold bracelets and rings set with precious stones, a silver purse and mirror, and a hoard of gold and silver coins amounting to 1,432 sesterces. They were found, carefully wrapped in pieces of gold, uh, cloth and wool, at the bottom of a wooden chest in the cellar of the house. Among the silverware were several valuable cups embossed with scenes of Greek myths and traditional Hellenistic landscapes. Almost three quarters of a of a century later, in 2000, two twenty pieces of silverware were discovered in a wicker basket in the dining room of a complex at Moraging, not far from Pompeii. Popular art and objects of everyday life. What is referred to as popular painting, most of which is found on exterior walls or trade signs, covers a whole range of human activities such as Scenes of different phases in the production of wool from the walls of Pompeii's largest textile shop, cloth makers and sellers, a carpenter at work, a baker handing out loaves of bread, tavern life, religious processions, the bustle of the forum, the profession of prostitution. Unfortunately, much of this type of painting has now disappeared completely due to exposure to the elements. An extraordinary number of paintings were found in the house of a wealthy widow known as Julia Felix. Although some are now badly defaced, they depict some of the activities that supposedly went on in the forum during the day. They are not, of course, strictly realistic. A Pompeian street scene in the, mind eye, in the mind's eyes of a Pompeian painter. There are images of ironmongers, shoemakers, women negotiating for the sale of cloth, a man buying a metal pan, a baker selling loaves, a greengrocer with a collection of figs for sale, a food vendor with a brazier selling snacks and drinks, beggars, hucksters and school students having their lessons. 
the very ordinariness of much of the objects found in Pompeii and Herculaneum is what makes them so valuable to historians in building up a picture of daily life in the first century AD. AD. Pots on a kitchen stove and other curious kitchen utensils, wooden furniture such as a cradle and clothes press, housing shrines, uh, sorry, household shrines, matting and ropes, a fisherman's net, scorch cloth, horses' harnesses, as well as medical instruments, all of which help us to recapture the sights and sounds of Pompeian and Herculaneum life. So what we've been, what's found is household objects, a cradle at Herculaneum, tripod at Pompeii, bronze kitchen utensils, bronze heaters, lamps, a brazier, three-legged table, a day couch, bell for calling services, uh, servants, bronze handles, types of food such as 81 carbonized loaves of bread, eggs and fish on a table, carbonized egg, breads, fruits, uh, bread cakes and fruit on a table, beans and grains on a counter, and jars full of nuts under a counter. Uh, e examples of commerce, wine and olive presses, amphorae, which were big um, uh, clay uh, cylinders that were um, made to carry um, large quantities of liquid. Cart, packed with wine jars, lava millstones, dolia, uh, bronze scales, glass jars. Transport, there was a gig for transportation of people, boats. A woven cord and horses sandals. Um, there was a gladiator gladiator's helmet, a pair of dice, black and white backgammon pieces, and surgical instruments, needles, probes, gynecological forceps, catheters, pincers, scalpels, and scissors, to name a few. Pompeii is a household name, yet in many ways. Herculaneum is even more extraordinary as a testimony to ancient life. The significantly different character of its destruction, buried to a depth of 25 metres by a succession of pyroclastic flows and surges, means that here we can recover many things largely unknown at Pompeii. Upper floors, even to two levels, wooden structures including beams, doors and flimsy particles, wooden objects, cupboards, shrines, screens, beds, and even a cradle. And that's Andrew Wallace Hadrill. Human, animal, and plant remains. Human remains include human skeletal remains from the beach at Herculaneum, studied by the classical archaeologist and anthropologist Dr. Sarah Bissell, Disarticulated bones and plaster and resin casts from Pompeii, studied by Dr. Estelle Les Laser, a forensic archaeologist. The human skeletons excavated so far from Herculaneum, as well as the disarticulated bones, plaster, and resin casts from Pompeii, are a va valuable source of information about the victims. They reveal such things as sex and age, appearance, average height of men and women general health, specific medical problems, and evidence of surgery. Um, population affinities, probable occupations and social status, and the cause of death and possible mental state at the time. The skeletons of Herculaneum. Up until the discovery of skeletons on the beach of the small ancient harbour of Herculaneum in 1982, very few human remains have been found in the town compared with the number of corpses found in Pompeii. As more skeletons emerged throughout the year in a row of chambers built into a retaining wall of the harbour, the previous hypothesis is that, uh, sorry, the previous hypothesis that there had been time for a mass exodus of Herculaneum's population became less likely. The skeletons of Herculaneum have been preserved in good condition because of the 20 metre thick layer of moist volcanic material that accumulated over the town. As the bodies of the inhabitants decay, decayed, the material compressed about the bones, preventing oxidi oxygen from causing 
further deterioration and eventually solidified to the consistency of rock. However, as Dr. Bissell explained, with exposure came quick deterioration and she had to work quickly to prevent it. She washed each bone separately and allowed it to dry for several days before dipping it in an acrylic plaster, uh, plaster mixture and leaving it to harden before reconstructing the skeleton. Her study of 139 skeletons, 51 males, 49 females and 39 children followed two anthropological methods. One, the measure and measurement and observation of the bones. She examined the long bones of the legs to ascertain the height, the state of the pelvis of the women to tell their ages and if they had children, facial bones for appearance, the upper shafts of the humeri or thoracic vertebrae to, vertebrae to tell if a person worked harder than usual, the state of all bones for level of nourishment and the teeth of an indication of the age of children and whether there was sugar in the diet as well as general nourishment. To a biochemical analysis. She carried out a chemical analysis to find evidence of lead poisoning and the presence of calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, zinc and strontonium. Bones with high level of zinc indicate the consumption of animal protein, whilst those high in strontonium indicate the consumption of vegetable protein and seafood. Bones and casts from Pompeii. Very few exact intact skeletons have been found in Pompeii because many were destroyed during the early years of excavation. Others were removed, some so carelessly stored in the Pompeian bathhouses that the bones became disarticulated and mixed. According to Estelle Laser from Sydney University, it is difficult to estimate the number of skeletons from the remaining collection of bones, but she suggests that there would be no more than 500, with approximately equal numbers of men and women. There were few bones of children, as their small bones were often missed in the excavations. In her detailed study of the Pompeian skeletal remains, Esther Laser incorporated modern technology such as the use of scans and x-rays. She concentrated on the skulls and teeth and pelvic leg and arm bones from 300 individuals. In Pompeii, unlike in Herculaneum, corpses were covered in a deep layer of fine ash and pumice which did not completely seal the bones from the deteriorating effects of oxygen. They decayed, leaving cavities in the hardened ash that archaeologists since the time of Fiorelli had filled with liquid plaster to form casts of the bodies as they were at the moment of death, including clothes, shoes, facial expressions and desperate gestures. In 1994, Estelle Laser upgraded the Fiorellian method by using translucent epoxy resin instead of plaster, which allowed the bones and objects on or beside the body to be seen. The available casts have a great potential as a research uh, resource which has not yet been exploited. Unlike the bones, the cast contains evidence of the whole person. The actual bones still exist within the cast. That was Estelle Laser in the people of Pompeii. Animal remains. These include horses and mules, still in the stables in the villa of Pisanella at Boscorio, and several donkeys, mules tethered in the um, stables of a bakery in Pompeii. Dogs, some still chained up at the entrance of houses, and goat and a goat in the cellar. It's sorry, and a goat in a cellar. Recently, the, a find of the bones of monk of a monkey came as a big surprise to archaeologists. It is believed that this animal may have been uh, may have belonged to a troupe of foreign performers. Plant remains and the work of Dr. Wilhelmina. Jashemsky. Dr. Wilhelmina Jashemsky carried out extensive studies into soil contours, roof 
root cavities of large ornamental trees, fruit uh, vines and fruit trees, carbonized plant res remains. 27 species alone were discovered in the carbonized hay found at the Plontus and pollen. She identified it, she identified 184 different plant varieties in the area of Vesuvius and these discoveries enabled her to build a profile of plant life at the time of the eruption. By supplanting, supplementing these with evidence from frescoes and literary references, archaeologists have been able to gain a clearer picture of produce and ornamental gardens in Pompeii, as well as many of the tim timbers used in doors and furniture. Some of these discoveries, such as the presence of vineyards and olive trees in Pompeii, has shown a different light uh, thrown a different light on its economy and the relationship between town and countryside. Evidence suggests that at least 10% of Pompeii was used for the cultivation of crops. Dr. Jashemsky revealed that there had once been a large commercial vineyard near the Pompeian Amphitheatre. Approximately 2014 vine root holes and cavities of their supporting stakes were plaster cast in this area, which today has been replanted with vines. Also, archaeologists have been able to recreate some of the gardens in the final resi finer residences of the city. The literary sources. Apart from Pliny the Younger's unique eyewitness account of the eruption of Vesuvius and his own experiences revealed in his letters to Tacitus, Many of the earlier and contemporary texts, while containing useful information, have a particular focus of inquiry. For example, Strata's, uh, sorry, Strabo's geography, written in 19 AD, was based on his own travels and research from the Great Alexandrian Library. He provided information on Vesuvius in its dormant phase, a description of the Sarno Valley and the port of, of Pompeii. Vitruvius's of Architecture, written in the 1st century AD, provides information of relevance to a study of the appearance of Greek and Roman houses, the activities that he believed took place in the various rooms, although these did not always correspond to the archaeological evidence. Comments on the construction of uh, public buildings, such as the acoustics of theatre, <coughs> of theatres, how basilica should be constructed, the features and dimensions of Roman fora, the heating of public baths, and the process of painting. The ancient who inaugurated the use of wall decorations at first imitated the variegated appearance and arrangement of marble stuccos. Later on, they began to imitate the shapes of buildings and protruding reliefs of columns and pediments. Tragic, comic, and satirical scene, scenic backgrounds were painted in open spaces such as Exedrae due to the enormous walled space, and that's Vitruvius in his book of architecture. Seneca's Naturales Questions, um, written in the 1st century AD, spoke of the natural features of Campania and the question of earthquakes. He wrote, The thread of my proposed work and the concurrence of the disaster at the time requires that we discuss the causes of these earthquakes. Or <clears throat> Pliny the Elder's Natural History, written in the first century AD, AD, refers to the attributes and produce of Campania, varieties of grapes in the region, varieties of local wine and their effects on the drinker, and the details of the olive industries varieties of fish and medicinal plants, the processes used by the fullers in the textile industries, one of Pompeii's most important businesses, various garden uh, building materials and processes involved in creating mosaic floors, the gardens of Pompeii and the invention of Nemora tonsilia or barbered groves, the name making of pigments for wall paintings, the names of some of the original Greek and Roman artists and description of their works from which many of the paintings in Pompeii and Herculaneum were copied. 
Historians have had to supplement these with the inscriptions and graffiti from the monuments of Pompeii and Herculaneum, as well as other literary sources, which throw a light on some of on some specific activities. For example, Cicero, who had a villa in the area, commented on the political activities in Pompeii when it became a Roman colony in 80 BC, and Tacitus described a riot between the Pompeians and their neighbours, the Nicerians, in a Roman amphitheatre in 59 AD. Thanks for listening.